Uh, so welcome uh, to everyone. Welcome to a, a slightly enlarged group, hopefully going forward. Uh, in addition to having uh, colleagues from Employment Support Scotland, we also have some people along from the Third Sector Employability Forum and also from uh, Scottish Training Federation. Uh, and that is in essence, I suppose, to hopefully make life uh, slightly easier for uh, Pamela and for Amy, rather than having them have to go and do uh, another update, I suppose, to similar groups of people who've got kind of, you know, a similar level of interest. So by way of introduction, uh, I, I know a lot of people on the call and I know a lot of names uh, that I haven't seen for a, a good number of years, which is nice to see. So my name is Paul De Pellet, uh, and I'm the chair of Employment Support Scotland. Uh, I'm also a, a trustee, I think it is now, of ERSA, uh, uh, as, as we are kind of moving towards charitable status. And my day job is that I, I work for a uh, a employability and education provider based in Scotland and England uh, called Triage. Uh, I'm joined today from Employment Support Scotland by Robin Turner, who again many of you will know. Robin's our Vice Chair uh, and also is the Chief Executive of Roots to Work. Uh, we also have Elizabeth Taylor, who's the Chief Executive of uh, ERSA, and we have Laura Benfield, who's the Head of Membership Services, whose name many of you will see uh, coming out uh, regularly with emails and updates. Uh, we have got this scheduled from uh, 10 o'clock through to midday. It may not go on quite that long. Uh, the first part of the meeting uh, is to uh, hear from uh, our colleagues at the Scottish Government on the progress that they're making on the, the No One Life Behind agenda. So we are joined by uh, Pamela Smith. Uh, Pamela, many of you will know, uh, works for the Improvement Service and has previously worked uh, across local authority, economic development and employment. Uh, projects for many, many years. Uh, Pamela is is kind of uh, playing an active role in leading on uh, bringing the No One Left Behind agenda to life uh, through this next phase of it. Uh, and uh, Pamela is joined by Amy Stewart, uh, who works for the Scottish Government in the service design uh, space. Uh, I think you may have another colleague joining as well. I think Carla should be on the call as well. So uh, the plan for uh, this session is that we are going to uh, hand the call across to Pamela and uh, Amy, and they will then talk us through where they're at, and there'll be an opportunity for any questions at, at the end of that. Following that session, we're going to we're going to uh, have uh, a bit of a conversation about the kind of the return to work. Uh, now that that we've got uh, some degree of permission to do that, and really, I suppose, to you know, ideally, probably break into smaller groups and just have a bit of a chat around what the considerations are, what each organisation is thinking about, how risks have been managed, what opportunities we see coming from that just so that we've got uh, an opportunity to share that from you know, an employability perspective in particular. And following that, we're going to have a, a general update on some of the upcoming uh, things that ERSA and Employment Support Scotland have got planned, uh, as well as, as hopefully a bit of a conversation on what you'd like to see us doing for the remaining meetings that we've got this year. So uh, I hope that's OK. I hope that's what you were expecting and that you're in the right call uh, from that point of view. Uh, we don't have Dr Phil with us today from Entitled To. Many of you who've been in the call before will know that, that Phil normally comes along and gives a, a very valuable update on, on where things are at in the, world of, uh, in the world of benefits and how that impacts on our participants and service users. Uh, he has produced a, an update on the latest changes to UC and a copy of that is embedded in the link. If you can't find it, I'm sure Laura can fire it on to you. Uh, it's always very useful. Phil's very expert in that area. So without further ado, I'm going to pass across now to uh, Pamela and Amy, or Amy and Pamela. I'm not sure what order you guys are going to do it in. Uh, thank you very much again for taking the time to come along. I know you're very busy and I know that there's a lot on and I know that there's a lot of people looking forward to hearing where things are at in all, in all uh, parts of the world with no one left behind. So over to you. OK, thanks, Paul. Um, and thanks for inviting Pamela and I along to speak with you today. Carla is going to share some slides for me. So while she does that, um, I'm conscious that I recognise a fair number of names in the call today, but equally I'm probably meeting some of you are speaking with you for the first time. So by way of introduction, my name is Amy Stewart. I head up the Employability Improvement and Design Unit within Scottish Government. Um, no one left behind, as you'll know, it's very much a shared ambition initially between Scottish and local government, um, but collaboration and partnership is at the heart of it. I'm um, really pleased to have Pamela Smith alongside today to present, and I'll let her introduce herself just now. For those of you who don't know her, I don't think there'll be many who don't know her, um, but Pamela, do you want to do a brief introduction before I kick off? 
Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, thanks, Amy. I think Paul uh, eloquently covered um, my role. And the only thing that was maybe missed out is that my substantive post is still in Falkirk Council. I'm currently on secondment. Um, so um, I still have my kind of day job back in a local authority, um, of which I've been part of for 34 years. So uh, if I haven't came across you in the world of local government and employability and local economic development, I don't know where you've been hiding. Uh, <laughs> and I'm looking forward to catching up with some uh, again on the call. So thanks, Amy. Okay, um, yeah, Pamela probably needs less of an introduction than myself, but we'll go into the slides now, Carla, thanks. So um, to start off and to recap, I suppose, our vision for No One Left Behind, as set out in the delivery plan that we published late last year in the policy documents that had come before that, it has the main aim of simplifying the employability landscape. This collective ambition is about more than how money is distributed. It's the desire to move away from nationally designed and commissioned services towards a local model. Um, and it is absolutely a change in how we currently work. But we do believe that it is a change that is necessary if we are serious about tackling some key issues. So we need to tackle the long term drivers of poverty and inequality. I'm sure that nobody here um, disagrees with any of this ensuring that people of all ages and backgrounds, including those who are further removed from the labour market, have access to the help and support that they need. And crucially, um, as part of No One Left Behind, developing the culture and practice that allows service users to influence and improve the design and delivery of the sports services that they may need to turn to at some point in their lives. It's also really important to note when we talk about a local model of delivery, that we are not talking about the funding simply transferring to local government for local government to deliver. I know that you all have heard us um, reflect on this many times. It's not a move to local authority delivery. It's about local governance and it's about all of us working together to make the best use of collective resources and improving the integration and alignment with other local services for the benefit of people um, and the communities that they live within. We know that improving outcomes for people and supporting them to achieve their goals and addressing inequalities is what drives all of us here today. And collective leadership and partnership is central to delivering on our ambitions. We know that we can't do it alone. Um, we absolutely want to work across sectoral and organisational boundaries, and that will bring challenges in itself. So we should be clear and upfront about that, but it also brings huge opportunity. The ambition around No One Left Behind absolutely aligns with the Christie Commission principles. A move to local governance of services resonates with wider ministerial ambitions and public sector reform, social renewal and place-based approaches that prioritise the needs of people and communities rather than policies and organisations. If we move to the next slide, um, Carla. No One Left Behind um, has been built on a broad and I would say growing evidence base. In this slide, we take a look at some of the key takeaways from significant pieces of work that we've carried out over the last decade, um, ranging from the need to reform wider public services, so back to Christie in 2011, to more specific pieces of work identifying challenges in the employability landscape specifically. This slide here absolutely doesn't cover everything. It couldn't cover everything. You'll know um, the people here today that there's been various consultations. So back in 2015, um, as part of the Scotland Act and the um, enhanced devolved powers coming to Scotland, we consulted on the future of employability support in Scotland, and that was resulted in Fair Start Scotland. And then we also continued with these discussions, reviewing employability services in 2018. The approach that we're taking through No One Left Behind aligns with more recent research as well. Um, conducted down south, New Local recommended a move from nationally designed and controlled programmes to a community-led approach in order to better meet the needs of people facing complex disadvantage. And that absolutely resonates with what we wish to work across the employability system to achieve. In addition to these publications, um, partnership and collaboration are absolutely at the heart of what we want to do. We've been developing elements of No One Left Behind in partnership, listening to users and stakeholders and what works well at the moment, as well as where improvements could be made. Um, so, for example, uh, some of you may have been involved in 
recent service standards workshops they ran in July, we heard from a range of providers around the challenges they face with some national programmes. Um, for example, feeling as though they have to jump through hoops just to tick boxes, and often the flexibility doesn't exist to do what they think they need to do to support users. But we did also hear about the things that work well at the moment, and we, we must look to learn from them and build that into our approach going forward. So an example here, the flexibility offered by some grant funding and the fact that providers and users aren't penalised for not hitting an arbitrary target. People from across sectors and organisations identified positive opportunities no one left behind can bring, such as removing elements that don't work well, increasing the efficacy of partnership on the ground to better meet user needs, and setting up a coherent system that genuinely has user need at its heart. We're also taking on board the Social Renewal Advisory Board suggestions of post-lockdown priorities to consider. So that includes a focus on transformational ideas and how to deliver real change as Scotland embarks on its journey of renewal after the pandemic. This resonates really strongly with the No One Left Behind principles and approach. Um, so pulling out some specifics, thinking about the further shift the balance of power so that individuals and communities have more control over decisions that affect their lives thinking about improving service delivery and design by empowering frontline teams and the people and communities they serve, building on new ways of working based on what has worked well during the pandemic and developing new arrangements for local governance, focusing everyone and all activities and building more resilient, fairer, healthier and stronger communities and places. And ultimately it is about people coming together and working together for um, the greater good to deliver the best outcomes for service users. Um, the next slide, please, Carla. So we know that you'll recognise how No One Left Behind fits into a wider policy landscape and plays an important role in helping us to collectively meet a number of wider aims. We can split this broadly um, into key three areas, although I, I would say it's just one way of cutting it and um, that there's many, many ways we could do this. Looking at some of the big priorities, um, starting with tackling poverty, we need to widen the links with the wider Fair Work agenda to deliver on our No One Left Behind principles, supporting inclusive growth by connecting people from all segments of the population to opportunities in the labour market, directly targeting child poverty through the Parental Employability Support Fund. Oh, okay. And it really is a joint endeavour with colleagues um, in social justice policy. Okay. Sticking with um, inequality, how we address inequality is a fundamental aim of No One Left Behind and our uh, ambition, I suppose, to create a system that supports users furthest from the labour market. Partnership across organisational and provider boundaries to view and supply employability support as holistic, covering a range of interventions, specialisms and sectors, and thinking really closely about the services that we know that people already access in their local areas and that are fundamental in supporting the whole journey um, towards and into work. So health, justice, housing, advice services, I'm not telling you anything here that you don't already know. Um, we absolutely also need to look at how we leverage the power of anchor institutions. So thinking about our ambitions for public sector reform, um, widen ambitions around community wealth building through the move to a place-based approach and making funding more accessible to smaller organisations are all key points that we have to take on board. So whilst I've focused on um, the kind of context that we are working within and the ambitions that we want to achieve, I'm going to hand over to Pamela now um, as we move on to think about the practical implementation of No One Left Behind and how we have been working to reflect on the feedback and views that we've captured from stakeholders so far. So Pamela, I'll hand over to you. Thanks a lot, Amy. Uh, so in terms of where we're at currently, um, we know most people on the call and we mo we know the most significant aspect to moving forward is the confirmation of the ministerial decision on further implementation, i.e. the move to phase two. Uh, and as you know, in terms of the national programmes, uh, phase two includes Employability Fund and Community Jobs Scotland. Uh, that's only an element of the resource but the move's a lot more transformational than that. Uh, as you probably know, the decision is now slightly behind uh, the milestone date set out within the critical path. Now, this isn't due to our lack of progress on the actions that were outlined in the delivery plan, as Amy said, 
uh, published in November of last year, but it's in response to the ask of a, a number of your re representative uh, membership bodies that are here today to meet with the minister uh, and have some further discussions on the implementation of the next phase. And that's currently still ongoing. Um, at the moment, there'll be a, another kind of scheduled uh, response to that when the minister returns uh, from leave. So our commitment to collaborate uh, and have a collaborative approach remains. And we want to work with you openly and constructively as we prepare for change. And No One Left Behind sets out to transform the employment support services in Scotland. And as Amy says, it is more than just about money. The transformation means change in the governance arrangements from national to local. It means a change in how services are designed, commissioned and delivered. And it means a change for providers and partners in how they engage. But ultimately, the main change is aimed at better supporting the needs of individuals, communities and local labour markets and ensuring that we have the flexibility to better respond to local demand, that we can reduce duplication and create stronger and more effective partnerships at a national, regional and local level. We recognise change is not a single event, so we won't suddenly get a ministerial decision and in April 2022, the change just happens overnight as uh, the new day dawns. We know that there's ongoing work to strengthen partnership at all levels as we continue to move towards and into the next stage of implementation and that this will be a, a progressive uh, process because again, it doesn't end in April 2022. The broad themes set out in the slide uh, in front of you reflect some of the key areas that you and your colleagues have been raising uh, questions about in the correspondence to the Minister and an engagement with us more generally in, in a number of uh, meetings. Welcome. And we welcome the opportunity to respond to those. Equally, I'm aware that there's a lot of discussion and engagement ongoing in many localities and that many of the organisations represented here today are also involved in some of those, um, given that they are involved in a range of different uh, activities throughout the country. So just moving through some of the, the boxes and putting a wee bit narrative to it, there is a, a broad general agreement from everyone uh, in terms of support for the principles and the approach of No One Left Behind. And we have also recognised in our discussions the importance and the need for some degree of national coherence. And we want to avoid the, the terrible postcode lottery so that we have core minimum standards uh, as we start to develop and services and approaches. So we are looking at developing a range of national frameworks, and these will be based on our collective common principles that we can build coherence into the approach, but still be able to realise the benefits of local flexibility. We'll also be able to widen access and involvement from a wider range of local and independent partners, including a lot of smaller organisations and employers, who may have a local footprint and will be able to contribute at that level. We are keen to stimulate innovation and creativity and continue to provide opportunities uh, for people to engage. Just look at the, the money again, because whilst it's not all about money, the money always seems to be the, the important thing. So No One Left Behind is about a more blended co-investment approach. And it's about, as Amy says, ensuring we pull all the available resources. Uh, and initially, we're looking at Scottish and local government uh, resources. We also, as you know, have ESF. And more recently, some areas have been putting propositions together for community renewal funding. And we're also having a look forward to the Shared Prosperity Fund. So within No One Left Behind, it's about a much more aligned approach to publicly funded employability support. This also includes the establishment of the shared measurement framework. And again, a number of you on the call or indeed your organisations uh, will be involved in, in that work stream. And I think we've lost a slide. Uh, and you, like me, might be looking at a lovely picture of Amy 
uh, instead. So you've got centre stage, Amy, uh, instead of the overhead. Carla might be able to um, get it up again. Um, although it was nice having a look at you as well, Amy. So in terms of the Scottish approach to service design, uh, I'm looking at the shared measurement framework. I think an important thing for us is about moving away from a payment by results model. Uh, I'm looking more at the services uh, that would deliver a service fee approach, uh, but also looking at delivering services that individuals need when they need them in the way that they need them. So we don't have all this eligibility or oh, 13 weeks on that, 12 weeks on this, that we can actually manage an individual's employability journey uh, much more seamlessly. We also published a national framework for local employability partnerships, and that was developed jointly between SCVO and Slade, and it was about providing a starting point to look at how we develop more uh, effective and functional local partnerships, both for strategic um, activity and for delivery. And we have been taking forward substantial work in how we strengthen those partnerships. And I know many of you on the call today have been involved in, in some of that activity. And we'll come back to partnership working uh, lately, later in the uh, presentation. We've also made progress on developing a customer charter. Uh, there's been ongoing work on national service standards and on a continuous improvement strategy. And again, through the shared measurement framework work stream and the service design work stream, a number of partners on the call have been actively contributing to that. We're also looking at developing a national provider forum uh, framework uh, so that there is some coherence around the involvement of providers at a national, regional and local level. Now, this goes beyond No One Left Behind, and we are hoping that it will involve all public sector partners who commission and fund employability related provision. So we'll be looking at involving our colleagues in DWP, SDS, as well as Scottish and local government. And it's important that that is shaped by providers, and we're hoping to pick that up on some further discussions we have scheduled uh, next week with your representatives. It's also important around employer engagement and in work progression that we align some of this investment. We also published a national framework for the delivery of the employer recruitment incentives, and that was accelerated by the Young Persons Guarantee. So again, another example of a national coherence, uh, but we did also have local flexibility. So that provided a core minimum standard and value uh, and it has been offering wraparound to kickstart and also provides support for those progressing from pre-employment activities into work. So currently we need jobs and um, employability fund and other uh, local funded pre-employment activity. The Young Persons Guarantee allocation to local governance was 45 million. Uh, and again, it's supporting a range of activities that I know some organisations on the call today are delivering in addition to local provision. The collective leadership, so we continue to work together uh, on the shared critical path with partners. And indeed, we have received a lot of valuable feedback from you on the critical path and on the deliverables and we are seeking to be increasingly transparent in our approach. The critical path highlights the high level activity and deliverables, which will help us take forward the implementation of No One Left Behind. Local partnerships are currently using the results of a recent self-assessment to strengthen and improve relationships at a local level, and they have either completed or are in the process of completing local improvement action plans aligned to the No One Left Behind approach and principles. We're also looking at increasing the strategic and operational effectiveness uh, and functionality of the partnerships. Our work is ongoing uh, and we'll come back to that with the Third Sector Employability Forum and the TSI surveys, because uh, we haven't as yet explored the, the connectivity between uh, both 
However, it is encouraging in our local survey that 80% of local authorities were already commissioning a significant range of employability services from a range of providers, in particular third sector providers, and they are committed to strengthening that local provision. Uh, we are looking at a national framework um, for procurement, and we'll come on to that um, shortly. So we are also involving public, private, and third sector in the overarching governance arrangements. And the minister has just agreed uh, a new arrangement, which will be communicated again once he's back from his uh, leave. But it will be representative of each part of the partnership. And we welcome your continued engagement on all of that with us and on the operational group uh, and the work streams. So as you know, the time for an approach to preparing for the next stage of uh, No One Left Behind, the implementation of phase two was published last year. We have recognised the impact of the pandemic on the labour market and the need to respond with solutions and provide continuity whilst deliver our wider ambitions on tackling poverty and inequality. The original timescale was extended by uh, or delayed by 12 months and the current programmes were extended by 12 months and that helped to support preparations for change and provided a, a level of stability. We've also been working with partners who currently deliver um, or manage the services to develop exit plans and support the planning for change. And we are looking at aligning uh, increasingly with the Young Persons Guarantee and No One Left Behind to minimise duplication and complexity for service users, given that No One Left Behind is an all-age and uh, needs-based person-centred approach. Um, so whilst the decision has been delayed slightly, as highlighted uh, earlier in the presenta presentation, we're so confident that we will meet key milestones and considerable work is ongoing and will accelerate over the coming months. Just a wee bit about the mixed economy of um, provision, uh, being mindful of the time. So again, we spoke, I spoke earlier about the substantial investment in employability. So this year there's 70 million in the Young Persons Guarantee. Uh, and also sitting alongside that is the UK government's plan for jobs. So we have Kickstart, we have Jets, the GFS, and we also have Fairstart, and we have other um, smaller scale provision. So whilst most of that is needed, there is a risk of duplication and increased complexity when we're committed to a simply person-centred approach. We are committed to a place-based approach to economic recovery and social renewal, as Amy said. So we need to look through No One Left Behind how we create the opportunities for that mixed economy of provision, but also taking them on board what's already in the space. That will be important as we move ahead and look at what's going to happen when we exit from the European Structural Funds. Uh, ESF currently provides in the region of 40 million uh, a year in employability. And again, as we move to the Shared Prosperity Fund, we want to have good solid foundations uh, to incorporate what it is that will come next, which is currently unknown. Uh, so again, the, the kind of final thing I'd like to say is just about commissioning, because I know uh, you're interested in that and we can come back to to any points that you might think we've uh, skipped over. So in terms of the mixed economy of provision, it's more than just a statement and a shared commitment. We now want to look at how we put in practice some of that. We in local government and Scottish government have been discussing with Scotland Excel the scope potential for a, a national framework for employability services. And for those who are unfamiliar, Scotland Excel is the procurement centre of excellence, if you like, for uh, local government. And they currently develop and manage on our behalf a range of national frameworks for other services and goods uh, that we might, across 32 authorities, um, seek to procure or commission. So we are looking at 
establishing the national framework that will be in place uh, to go live in April 2022. And Scotland Excel have given us an indicative time table, which we will share. But I think it's important to note that we are looking to establish uh, an advisory input from stakeholders. And again, we will discuss with your representatives uh, the best way of taking that forward because we want to look at um, taking forward some of the recommendations that you collectively have made to us around procurement and commissioning. We also want to explore different forms of commissioning in terms of grant, as well as uh, the framework and potentially dynamic purchasing systems uh, as well. We also want to look at building in supplier development, meet the buyer events, uh, and have some broader stakeholder engagement. Uh, we are likely to come out week after next with some more definitive detail on that and some dates, again, hopefully coinciding with any um, decision from the minister. Um, but again, it's encouraging for you to note that 80% of local employability partnerships currently commission uh, from the third sector. And when we did a recent survey, in terms of training providers, 76% were want to procure accredited and certificated training, and just under 70% wanted to procure vocational and sector specific support. So there's a clear role uh, for training providers moving forward. I think just finally on that, it's important to know that phase two will create additional resource and additional opportunity. Um, phase two is very different in nature and in value from phase one. And I think it's important to recognise that that is um, quite a different um, shift in terms of local governance and stakeholder involvement. So again, because we're, we're time limited, I think I'll, I'll stop there. I've maybe skipped over a couple of things, but hopefully touched on the, the main areas. Uh, and again, we have some questions on the next slide, uh, but I think both Amy and I are happy to be led by any questions that have been generated by your input or any particular points that you have been kind of sitting waiting to ask. And we'll try and answer what we can today. What we can't answer, we'll take away. Carla's going to take a note of them and we'll commit to coming back to you. Um, Carla, can you put the questions up that we had uh, maybe prepared previously on the slides? Uh, but again, it's up to Paul and his members on the call whether they want to um, focus on those or whether they have their own questions they want to come back on. Um, so thanks for that, Paul, and I'll hand back over to you. Pamela, Amy, thank you very much for that. That was, uh, that was really informative. And uh, good to see the progress that's being made. I think even in uh, even in the kind of the, the the last you know six or seven weeks since I've last probably had some engagement with you guys, uh, I can see that there's certainly some things you're telling us that are that are new. So that's that's good to see. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. While people are are uh, perhaps digesting the three kind of suggest discussion points, can I just ask anyone that, that that either wants to ask a question to raise their hand? or if they have a specific point that they want to raise uh, to put it in the chat and um, either myself or Laura will try and make sure we keep track of those. Uh, anyone want to go first? I think there's a, there's a point in the chat from Mark uh, Timmins, uh, who's perhaps suggesting that things are, are not getting off to a particularly positive start in the Scottish borders where there's not uh, any significant desire to work with the third sector. Uh, Angela, uh, you've got your hand up. Do you want to come in and ask a question? Angela Hamilton. Hi, um, sorry, I'm, I've got a bit of a throat problem. So um, for anybody that knows me, that's a positive thing. I'll not be able to speak for too long. Um, I was just at the beginning um, when you were chatting, Amy, you were talking about, you know, the importance of local provision and, you know, it's driven locally and partnerships at a local level. Um, Where's the future for Fair Start Scotland in that? Um, and what you know, ha, is there a future for Fair Start Scotland under that kind of framework? Um, and also, how do we make sure that whatever we're doing 
aligns with UK government um, funding that crops up now and again and we always seem to be chasing our tail to try and find out what's going on at a local level when funding's been made available at UK government level. So typical examples of that is the CARES, the um, Commission Agreement for Employability and Health Related Services. I mean, I was scrambling about for ages trying to work out what was actually going to happen with that in Scotland. And all that I'm aware of at the moment that's been provisioned under that is JETS, which isn't even for people that have got, you know, significant support needs and employability. So I'm just wondering how you're going to ensure all that happens. Sure. Um, so in terms of Fair Start, you'll, well, you'll know that we've extended it for two years. So up until um, March 23, that current contract will end. I mean, right now, I, I can't give you an answer in terms of what will happen come 23. What I would say is that the Minister and Scottish Ministers have set out a direction of travel in terms of how we do want to um, invest employability spend and the route for doing that is certainly through the no one left behind mechanism. I'll be honest and say that right now our focus is on the kind of phase two and making sure that we get this right and then we'll turn to think about that but we will absolutely take that forward collaboratively and look to work with people to help us um, shape the future there. In terms of the kind of how do we look at the investment coming from DWP and how do we make sure that this is aligning properly? Well, I guess that there is a, there's different answers there at a national level. Scottish Government, we've definitely enhanced our working relationship with DWP. Um, and I feel like we're far more in the front foot now in terms of the flow of information. So there probably is a role in terms of how I can help there. And as a specific case that you've given there, so I'm happy to take that away and do a wee bit of digging and see what I can find out and then see what we can learn in terms of how we work together moving forward. But I think actually it's where the local employability partnerships kind of come into full effect as well in terms of looking across the board at the range of support that's available and whether that's at a national or local level and making sure that it's kind of complementary services that are being commissioned at a local level. Thank you. OK, so we've got a question in the chat from John Donnelly at Lennox Partnership uh, asking for any guidance or examples of good practice on how to effectively engage potential service users and service design would be really useful and could perhaps built into the national framework. That's more of a comment than a question. Yeah, that's a, that's a really important point. And it's, you know, the Scottish approach to service design, it's fundamental um, to what we're doing. We've got just now a national employability lived experience panel, um, which is fantastic. It's contributed to developing the customer charter so far. I mean, a really positive piece of work that's been taken forward. We've also got a national design group um, where a number of partners from um, local government, public, private, third sector are represented. And that group will be thinking around how do we build capacity across um, the whole system to take forward this approach. What I would say in terms of guidance and good practice, we are looking at developing a design toolkit um, and it'll be later this year that we finalise that and we'll be able to share that um, in due course. OK, thank you, thank you, Amy. I, I can maybe just, while people are just going through these questions, I can maybe just ask a couple of things if that's OK. Uh, is there is there any likelihood that we, uh, I think this is probably something that's shared by most delivery organisations as a degree of frustration, is there any likelihood that we can we can we can uh, look forward to a move away from uh, annualised funding uh, that we've experienced under various programmes. I know that's a that's a frustration for a lot of organisations. And also connected to that, are are we likely to see any move away from the kind of if you like kind of barriers that exist between you know programmes and people not being able to go in one programme because they're on another, or not being able to get access to skill support because they're too long-term unemployed. Is that figuring in your, your thinking around how you remove some of those uh, frustrations and, and things that impact on delivery? I'll come in first, Pamela, and then I'm sure you'll want to come in as well. In terms of annualised funding, I'd love to I'd love to say yes. It's a it's a frustration. I absolutely appreciate it. It's something we're looking at, um, and that's probably as much as I can say just now. It was certainly um, noted in terms of the manifesto um, ahead of the election, so it's definitely something that's been looked at. 
in terms of you know looking at the pain points between different programs it's something that's come through really strongly in terms of our own lived experience panel and yeah it, it is something that no one left behind can help us to tackle so no one left behind it will take us away from looking at the kind of eligibility criteria and what you're eligible for and users making a decision on that basis to actually a one-stop shop where they access the services that they really need. So yeah, I, I think it absolutely will have positive um, impact there. Pamela, you probably um, have a bit more knowledge of that on the ground than yeah. me. Yeah, so firstly, um, you won't be surprised to know that uh, local government are looking at multi-annual funding uh, as well, and that's one of our constant um, asks of uh, Scottish government. I'm sure they are asked of UK government, et cetera, and so it goes on. But uh, certainly moving to some more certainty beyond a year uh, is within our um, discussions as well. In relation to eligibility, I mean, in uh, Falkirk, um, we did do a lot of that, and it was by default rather than by design. Um, and if we are truly going to embrace the Scottish approach to service design, we have to put the needs of the individual at the centre. Uh, and I was always surprised at um, young people or um, people with disabilities or other folk, if they're on one programme, they weren't able to get wraparound support that they required because in some way someone else would be claiming an outcome and uh, might get paid for it there for another provider or another fund wasn't going to uh, kind of support that. So the move away from the kind of real focus on job outcome payments um, to more service delivery around integrated support, which will also mean that uh, an individual might be getting various interventions from a, a range of providers as well, if that's what's more appropriate. So I think we need to look at how we and put some live examples forward. We're trying to do that in terms of Kickstart, Young Persons Guarantee, ERI, but there's also things like in work support, mental health support, um, other um, support that individuals need that haven't maybe traditionally been seen as employability. Uh, and we need to look at how we scope that in at a local level. So I'm, I'm really keen that we do uh, look at that, Paul. And again, if we can get some of the jagged edges um, raised, it means we can do some solution focused discussions rather than in theory, we can actually look at some of these issues in practice and hopefully we have a bit more power to do something about it. Yeah, I'm sure that would be welcome, Pamela. Thank you for that. Uh, Tommy McDade, you've got a question, Tommy. Yeah, just to go back to uh, look at the discussion point number one, since we seem to be ignoring the discussion points, but anyway, maybe they're too hard <laughs> to answer though. Um, just an observation, is there anything in terms of common themes and areas, common areas for improvement coming from the like of self-assessments that maybe us as representative bodies or individual providers could support um, the development and in, in, in taking them forward at either a local level or collectively? Um, you know, I would probably say, you know, I, I mean, pretend to speak on behalf of everyone here, but I'm quite sure definitely representative bodies would be more than happy to support any development of these areas for improvement and take them forward. Um, I think I, you know, I fully support the multi-annual uh, pleas. Um, I know from the uh, partnership talks with some local authorities, there's a wee bit of frustration around the young person's guarantee allocations at the moment where, you know, there's good allocation of funding being given to local authorities, but you know, I know a number of local authorities are already expressing concerns about being able to, you know, spend that and want to carry it over. And for me, that's, you know, something that should be supported. Um, if we're looking at transforming employability landscapes in local areas, then things like that, some sort of certainty around things like that would be really helpful because that just gives that, as I say, that certainty to develop partnerships, identify areas for improvement among partners locally and really strengthen employability provision going forward. So there's a number of things there that maybe maybe we, the sector can help. Definitely. Thank you, Tommy. And the multi-annual thing, I, I, I think we all understand, you know, the, the, the restrictions that, that come from that. But I think it's also about looking at the examples of where there are multi-annual uh, funding streams, both in employability uh, and uh, in other services and, and recognising that it, it's a kind of 
It's a technocratic issue, to be perfectly honest. Uh, that has a, 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 a hugely significant uh, impact, not just on the ability to kind of continue the delivery of services, like you know the, the challenges Tommy's talking about around young persons guarantee. You get the funding, and your immediate thought is bloody hell, can we spend it in the period of time that we've got? Uh, but it also impacts, and this is one that I know a lot of organisations find frustrations with. It impacts on how attractive a place to work this is for uh, people that we want to come and use their talents and skills uh, to support other people. Uh, that uncertainty that's created by, you know, well, I have a job, you know, after March, that there's an absolute human impact in that, and people leave the sector, uh, or the collective sectors, because they, they don't get the stability that they need to, to live their lives. And it's rather ironic that, that what we're aspiring to for our service users, uh, we're not actually giving to the people that are vital in delivering those futures for service users. So I think, you know, that it, making progress in that area would be would be welcome, I think, for everyone on that front. Are there any other, uh, I suppose, observations? I mean, I think that these these discussion points are really useful to have. And and, and if we don't, we've obviously not had a lot of hands coming up, uh, Amy. So it may well be that that a, a more appropriate uh, way of reflecting back is for individuals to, to to perhaps kind of directly come back to to, to yourself and to Pamela and to Carla uh, on these three points, more from the point of how they see it from their own organisation rather than necessarily for the whole sector, because I think it is certainly useful to get more feedback. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to raise anything and any questions that anyone wants to ask either relating to the discussion points or separate to that? I'm conscious of time and we're probably overrunning a little bit in the amount of time that we'd booked you guys out for. Elizabeth, do you want to come in? Yeah, I, I was just aware that uh, Pamela had talked about some surveys and we'd be very happy to put them out to us uh, members if that was useful and uh, I'm aware that there's a seem to be a third sector focus but there's certainly a large third sector body of membership within ursa so uh, perhaps we could pick that up um after this meeting or my colleague laura benfield will be yeah i mean tsf um did do a survey so again maybe lorna um or any other colleagues in the call from tsf might want to come in there because I don't know what their intention, Elizabeth, is in the, the follow up to that one. Um, but certainly um, we'd be keen to involve all kind of representative bodies moving forward if we have any other uh, things we want to consult on. And it might be worth us looking at Monday around uh, the kind of main conduits into that if we want to put anything on these national frameworks, etc. for for comment uh, and get them out a bit wider because I know um, sometimes when you speak to one person local government you think everyone gets the information that that isn't always the case not that I'm saying you guys don't cascade information um, but there's always somebody feeling left out somewhere and um, so maybe the Employment Lake Scotland website we can direct some um, things through there to make it a bit more uh, transparent as well. That would be helpful. Thank you for that, Pamela. OK, so unless we have any final questions, uh, if I could just uh, take this opportunity to thank uh, Amy and Pamela and Carla again for taking the time to come along. I'm, I'm conscious that you guys, it must feel like a bit like, you know, being on tour uh, without leaving your house, that is. But, you know, you're you're taking the show on the road and you're talking to lots of people. And uh, I know that might seem a bit repetitive, but it, the reality is that there'll be people on this call here who are probably you know, hearing some of these things for the first time, which probably goes to show you how hard it is to reach into all the nooks and crannies of people who are involved in employment support. Uh, we will uh, send out the slides if that's OK, and, and I would urge anyone that has any uh, thoughts and views once they've had the chance to reflect on it on those three points raised by uh, Amy and Pamela to, to please feed them back. Uh, I'm sure the contact details will be on the slides. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, thank you. Um, just thank to say you. that if there's any points we've missed that are in the chat bar, I think Carla's been taking a note of.